with uh, Helen Collinson, who's with uh, Christian Aid, and she's daring to be in Jersey today, and she's been speaking to people in the finance industry. So what have you discovered about Little Jersey? Well, I've discovered that there's a lot more to Jersey than the finance industry. Um, I've only been here for 24 hours, so I can't reckon to know a huge amount about Jersey yet. Um, but I have picked up on the fact that things aren't going well for some people on Jersey. I've heard a lot of talk about how um, high housing prices, um, unemployment starting to creep up, and uh, I've heard about a public swimming pool that's been empty for a long time and just a private swimming pool. So. I don't know, I'm thinking um, maybe there's some unease in Jersey about the future and that um, the current model of the economy maybe isn't working for all of Jersey's residents um, and so you know, perhaps that resonates um, with um, some debates elsewhere about um, what's uh, offshore financial centres like Jersey should be engaged in and we had the Guernsey um, outgoing deputy last week Charles Parkinson um, talking um, quite forthrightly about maybe the need for Guernsey to diversify. Another example of somebody leaving office and saying the right thing it's a bit ironic really yes, isn't it? Yes, I mean I suppose Looking back at the round table organised by Business Connect today, which was a great debate, and there were over a hundred people there, which was fantastic. Um, so that was very exhilarating. What was depressing is that Jeff Cook from Jersey Finance um, seemed to be very defensive. Um, and the point I was making is that um, there's no getting away from it. Um, the writing is on the wall in terms of. Uh, financial secrecy, um, bodies all over the world are calling for greater financial transparency from the World Bank to the OECD to the CBI um, in the UK, hardly a radical <laughs> revolutionary Today's outfit. lunchtime meeting you are engaging with the Christians to a large extent, there will be it, uh, Christians working in the finance industry, did mm. you get any particular vibes out of that? Did you get a sense of what was going on here from a Christian point of view? Well, I think um, clearly there are some committed Christians um, within the business community here and we certainly found that that can be a very important lever. Um, I'll give you an example I was going to mention in the round table but we ran out of time. Um, back in London um, there's a very committed um, lay curate of a, a church in central London that better remain nameless. Um, and this person is also a tax lawyer in one of the world's largest multinational companies. And um, his uh, Christian calling um, is what led to him becoming a lay curate. But he's also, I guess, he has a heightened sense of responsibility and he's really examined his conscience and his role in his day job. So he's convening... Um, quite regular meetings now between ourselves, various other NGOs and very senior people in multinational companies and uh, in the big four accountancy firms etc. So that's a forum that he's brought together for us where we can have a really interesting dialogue and debate and potentially is helping to sow seeds of change uh, we hope in the future. Um, and there's quite a lot happening within the private sector now on tax. You know, it's starting to be treated as an issue of corporate social responsibility. Well, we had a very interesting speaker a few weeks ago at the same uh, lunchtime meeting. An independent bank uh, from London, which has been there a very long time, was there at the time of the Clapham sect. A familiar theme which came out today with uh, Sierra Leone. Mm -hmm. They were involved all that time ago. This independent bank, Hawes Bank I think it was called, oh, right, yeah, yeah. with uh, anti-slavery and it yeah. still says it's doing good things and supporting mm. worthwhile causes and mm. not making too much profit, mm. the sort of friendly face of capitalism, yeah. Yeah. if there is such a thing, and yeah. they, they, I believe the man, he was sincere enough. Yeah. But the Sierra Leone thing was uh, in my mind today when I was listening to the discussion because that, uh, again the anti-slavery thing of 200 years and it's often mentioned in the context of finance. It, it's, mm. There is a similarity isn't there? Mm.
mm. and the way the slave traders had to pack in eventually, just after the 1800s, mm. and that's going to happen to, do you think, finance centres or? Yes, I mean, if you look at Sierra Leone, um, you know, it's depressing. I, I was just looking last night at the, the figures, this is going back a few years, but I don't think it's changed that much. You know, in 2006, um, the profits that companies in Sierra Leone made from diamond and rutile um, extraction um, was in the region of $186 million, and only $9 million tax was paid on that, you know, which is 6%. Um, and this is one of the poorest countries in the world, you know, with, with one of the worst child mortality rates. Um, and people say, um, you know, aid isn't working because we've still got that ter those terrible levels of poverty. Well, I say to those people, it's not surprising that aid isn't working when there's that amount of money and resources going out of these countries um, without very much tax being paid. You know, it's a new form of colonialism, basically. The people who facilitate the escape of tax, and very often it's corrupt governments, huge funds of, I uh, think, of Nigeria, the most infamous cases, huge sums of money, arms dealers, and it finishes up very often in Jersey, but places like Jersey. But the facilitators are the respectable bankers, lawyers, accountants, not all Christians, but many of them are Christians. Is it reconcilable, do you think? I think it's, I, I mean, I don't think anybody has a, a truly clean conscience, you know. I mean, I travelled to Jersey on a plane, I could have got a boat, you know. I'm concerned about climate change and carbon emissions from aviation are worse than boats, you know. Um, we all live in an affluent society and people, other people in the world go to bed hungry. So I don't think anybody, you know, sitting in Europe can have a completely clean conscience. It's a very unequal world out there. Um, and um, so, you know, I, I don't think Christian Aid or, or I personally, um, you know, are wanting to attack individuals. I thought it was interesting today that Father Macaulay thought actually every individual has to examine their conscience. So it isn't just systems, systems are made up of individuals. Um, but, you know, we all need to have jobs. Financial services are important, they're essential to economies. Um, it's really important to have people within the finance industry who are saying something different and saying this is not sustainable, it's not going to work long time, we need change. At the end of the day, it's the industry which is going to change things. You know, we can try and get politicians on board, but we need business and we need the finance industry itself to recognise that change... I do happen. worry a bit because the, the heaps, the layers of regulation that there are, Professional people are supposed to have ethical, professional responsibilities. Uh, the layer, the regulation that's being introduced to prevent abuse, uh, the judicial system, policing systems. Mm -hmm. There are layers and layers of systems, morality, um, human rights, all over. All mm -hmm. supposed to be international human rights, prevent mm -hmm. these abuses taking place. Mm -hmm. Christian is. Yet another set of Christian beliefs, another set of rules and regulations. Yeah. Can any of it really work? I mean, what what is missing about this? Why is there this fundamental lack of human morality about these sorts of fairly obvious issues? Mm. I think it can happen because I think at the end of the day, people are bothered about the morality of what they do, and they don't like the thought of you know, working for something which is immoral. Um, I think maybe people have decided that what, you know, that if they're involved in uh, tax dodging, perhaps they've decided that, you know, that's still acceptable um, because they think that they're still contributing to economic growth in some way. Um, so everybody has a, a different way of, of justifying things, but... Um, I think uh, everybody has to continue to examine what they're doing, you know, and, and I don't think it's enough just to say, well, this is legal, so it's okay, um, because uh, we all find ways of getting around laws and stretching them, and um, I think, you know, in that sense, I think that Christian morality is quite useful, actually, because um, 
a lot of people in society are Christian and can understand that there is, they're, in a way, they're accountable to a higher power. You know, it's not, they're not just a, accountable to, to laws. There was reference today to the, Le the London demo, which is part of the, an international demonstration which has been taking place outside some polls in London. Yeah. And there was a question asked, why doesn't it happen in Jersey? Did you, what did you make of the answers that were given on that? Why is it not happening here? Hmm. Well, I, I can't comment. I felt it, I wasn't able to comment because I just haven't been here for long enough. Um, I think um, probably, I mean, look, I do know about the UK and I think that people in the UK involved in the Occupy movement probably have no idea um, about the very strong linkages between um, the finance sector in Jersey and the City of London. Maybe if they knew more about that, they might actually be turning off in, in St Helia. Um, as to whether there are people in Jersey itself who are prepared to take that kind of action, I don't know. I also think, because I'm a campaigner and I, I'm always looking at what's going to work, would an Occupy movement actually bring about the changes that you, you want? You know, uh, Occupy in the UK has been quite useful in getting things on the agenda, um, whether it's actually going to change things politically or policy-wise, I don't know. So maybe you've got other ways of doing things in, in Jersey, you know. Um. I haven't noticed them yet. <laughs> right, okay. As a naive socialist, yeah. the, uh, one looks for answers to these very fundamental problems, but the, the fundamental problems, but I don't, perhaps you can tell me, the Christian aid role, is it looking at the unfairnesses in uh, structures in the United Kingdom, like employers. Uh, it used to be back in the 60s, say for example, it used to be very, uh, car workers had a very bad deal. Mm. And there was a lot of campaigning about repetitive jobs they were doing, all these sorts of things. Does Christian Aid look critically at the sort of capitalist activities that are going on on a fairly domestic scale in the UK? No, we don't. And that's because we are a charity, and our charitable purpose is to uh, to uh, reduce poverty and relieve suffering overseas. Um, so, uh, no, we don't. I mean, we are, though, aware of the fact that the world is changing and there is inequality everywhere. And I thought it was interesting that Father Macaulay talked about the poverty in our, you know, within the society in Jersey, and that's certainly the same in the UK. And it is also the case in India or China or some of these emerging economies. So it's less now about North and South, you know, that the affluent north and the poor south, it's now about a problem of global inequality and inequality within countries and within societies. So on that basis, the tax issue does give us an opportunity to make those linkages and to point out, for example, that tax dodging is a problem for developing countries, but obviously it is for developed countries as well, which is partly why Sarkozy even David Cameron and Osborne, etc., have got quite exercised about tax dodging. They um, suddenly become aware of it for some miraculous reason. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, for example, we we're going to be um, having a tax justice bus going round the UK and Ireland um, in the autumn. Um, sadly, not coming to Jersey. <laughs> I hope it's a single day because it won't. Um, and we're doing that with Church Action on Poverty, which is a small organisation in the UK that's working on poverty in the UK, because we want to make those linkages. But it's difficult for us as a charity, an overseas charity, to do that without working in coalition with others. There are many, many organisations around the world doing the sort of thing you're doing, criticising aspects of finance centres and the worst excesses of capitalism. Do you have a huge international conference? There's some, is there some great cooperation going on or are you basically individual groups doing your own thing? Um, increasingly, we're contributing, we hope, to building a global movement on this. And a lot of people have said that this ought to be as big as the Drop the Debt campaign, the Jubilee Debt campaign, um, you know, as big as Apartheid or some of these other movements that became very global. Um, in the digital age, it's actually quite easy to start to create a global movement. Um, obviously, the Tax Justice Network already has a structure. Christian Aid does fund um, various member organisations of the tax, tax Justice Network around the world, some of them doing very grassroots stuff, 
some of them not working on tax transparency stuff, but looking at unfair tax systems, the emphasis on VAT and indirect taxation rather than income tax, those sorts of things. Um, but um, we're now trying to ratchet that up, and we have contributed to the creation of a global campaign called M Tax Haven Secrecy. And interestingly, we, we were very clear that it should be called M Tax Haven Secrecy, because we don't want people in offshore financial centres to think that we're kind of, you know, we're, we're just against financial centres. What we're particularly focusing on is the lack of transparency and the secrecy. So um, it's quite a broad-based campaign. It can have lots of different organisations that have different positions on tax havens, but everybody is signing up to the fact that there needs to be more transparency. We've now got about 62 organisations around the world signed up to that, um, and it's being focused on uh, putting pressure on the G20. So on the eve of the G20 last year, um, we uh, managed to get a meeting with President Sarkozy, who was chairing the G20, with other French CSOs, and presented a letter to him, and were able to say to him that we'd collected um, 50,000 signatures um, uh, calling on on him as the chair of the G20 to take action on tax haven secrecy at the G20. Um, Since we've been talking a little bit about finance, is finance a problem for your your action group? Um, well, it's in in Jersey. Uh, from what I understand, um, some people have um, taken exception to our work on tax, and so our um, wonderful supporters here have had quite a struggle on their hands the last three years. Um, I'm hoping that over time people can see that you know we're we're not trying to attack Jersey, and we're not even singling out Jersey. Um, you know, we're calling for greater financial transparency and we want tax havens to kind of be part of that. Um, so, you know, hopefully that will change. Um, I mean, Jeff Cook said today that we were doing this work um, as a means of raising revenue. We absolutely are not. <laughs> you know, if you look at what's happened in Jersey, that's not the case. Um, and you know, when we first started working on tax, um, we put a toe in the water probably about seven years ago. Um, and then we launched a, a public campaign three, four years ago. Um, nobody was talking much about this. They certainly weren't talking about tax as an, as an international development issue. So it wasn't a way of getting media coverage. I think we've got the media coverage because um, in the fallout from the financial crisis, people have been looking at why that happened. And now we've got the public sector cuts and governments want to try and plug the gaps and they want to therefore clamp down on tax dodging. Those are the reasons why tax has become higher profile. And maybe we've contributed to that. Um, Did you get any similar hostile response from Christians in the Isle of Man or Guernsey? Or? Um, yes. To be honest, probably we've had more hostility from Jersey than we have in Guernsey or the Isle of Man, but it's also been quite difficult. Mm -hmm. um, accompanying me here for these few days is Phil Crane, who's a part-time worker for Christian Aid on the Isle of Man. Um, originally trained as an accountant, actually, so he knows his stuff. Um, so, you know, I mean, talking to Phil, um, he has to manage quite a difficult balancing act. Um, and, um, I mean, you know, it, it's interesting that, um, you know, the Isle of Man um, is another tax haven and, um, uh, or let's say, I, I know that maybe people don't like the term tax haven, so let's say an offshore financial centre. Well, my um, so generally speaking, they're more regulation havens, but that's by the way. All right, okay. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, I don't know whether Phil would say that he'd contributed to this, but the Isle of Man has taken some small steps, and one step they took, for example, was to fully adopt the EU Savings Tax Directive, which meant that in the Financial Secrecy Index they went from 24, they're quite high up, to 36. You know, arguably that was a contributory factor. Jersey hasn't yet done that, you know, so... Um, more work yet to be done. More work. <laughs> <laughs> I think Guernsey has as well. Yeah. Yeah. We'd better leave it there, but uh, we shall be interested to hear what you have to say if you come back again. Thanks. Okay. Thanks a lot. <laughs>